Good morning, everyone. Good to have you out for our morning service. Once again, let's take our hymnals and stand together and turn with me to number 343. 343 as we sing Revive Us Again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for thy spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our light. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain. Who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again. Fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. And if you take your Bible, please, and find the Psalms. Psalms chapter 143, please. Psalms 143, and our memory verse for the week will be verse number four. Ready? Psalms 143. Psalms chapter 143, verse four. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is desolate. Psalms chapter 143, verse 4. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. Psalms chapter 143, verse 4. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. Psalms chapter 143, verse 4. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is desolate. And if you remain standing, 145, please. One hundred forty-five, it is well with my soul. Let this blessed assurance 
control that Christ hath regarded my helpless estate and hath shed his own blood for my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my faith shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound and the Lord shall descend. Even so it is well with my soul. It is well with my soul. It is well, it is well with my soul. And you may be seated.
143, please. read these 12 verses for us and then we'll pray and I want you to look carefully at the scriptures this morning my subject is depression my topic is the man after God's own heart the title I got early this morning on my knees while some of you were sleeping overwhelmed or overcomers. It begins, Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. In thy faithfulness answer me, and in thy righteousness. And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For the enemy hath persecuteth my soul, and you couldn't hurt the Bible by saying, pursued my soul. Hath spent my life down to the ground, he hath made me dwell in darkness, as those that have been long dead. Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. My heart within me is desolate. I remember the days of old, I meditated on thy works. I mused on the work of thy hands. I stretched forth my hands unto thee. My soul thirsteth after thee as a thirsty land, Selah. Selah means what about that or think about that. Hear me speedily, O Lord. My spirit faileth. Hide not thy face from me lest I be likened to them that go down into the pit. Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto thee. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee unto thee to hide me. Teach me to do thy will, for thou art my God, thy spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for thy name's sake. For thy righteousness' sake, bring my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, cut off my enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul for I am thy servant. Amen. And Father, as we wait upon you this morning, I pray for Marianne as I heard her mother passed this last week. I pray, Lord, that thou would work with her and through her family with this passing to realize that life is short and eternity is long. I pray for those who are going through a time of darkness, going through a time of distress upon their souls. And I pray, O oh God, that thou will deliver us from doubt, discouragement, 
depression, and fear. Be with those who are away with illness, those who are working, and Lord, those who are away because they chose to be away. Bless each precious family here this morning. Watch over the children in the nursery. Bless the junior church and the teacher. And may thy word go forth with power there and in here. Pray for our viewers that they might hear from thy word. And Lord, we might be attentive to thy word. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. David has been ascribed to having read, written about 70 of the 150 Psalms. And chapter 40, 142, verse 3, is akin to our memory verse in chapter 43 and verse 4. Chapter 142 and verse 3 says, When my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Then thou knowest my path. In thy way wherein I walked, have thee privily laid a snare for me. David in his lifetime, as a young man, did the work as of a shepherd. David had fought for the sheep by defeating a lion and a bear. <clears throat> Young man David was a hero of Israel when he defeated the giant Goliath of Gad. And yet David now is once again running from an enemy. However, this time it's not Saul. King Saul was extremely jealous over David when David defeated Goliath. You would sometimes take a moment to read Deuteronomy chapter 17. You'd find out that God has information to a king. A king was responsible to write a portion of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the five first chapters of the Bible. A king was responsible not to drink. A king was responsible to have but one wife. A king was to govern and protect his people. Saul didn't do that. <clears throat> Saul was a coward. Saul went out into eternity lost. Saul dogged David's trail for a very long time. And finally, David's best friend, Jonathan, who chose to go back with his dad when he should have stayed with David, his two brothers and his fathers, and died in battle. And that was a heartbreak to David, and yet David, in his grace, in God's grace and in his mercy, would later bring Mephibosheth, Jonathan's son, crippled son, to the palace and care for him and take care of him. And then David, as you know, had many wives. And from one of those wives came a handsome young man by the name of Absalom. Absalom was beautiful in his lifetime, just a handsome specimen of a man. But David, having a home, a dysfunctional home with all of his wives and half-brothers and half-sisters, there came a time when Absalom's sister was raped by her stepbrother, Anmon. And that didn't sit well with Absalom, and so Absalom had him killed. You know, when David sinned with Bathsheba, and we think about sin, we think that we get away. Nobody gets away. Be sure your sin will find you out, and it does. And God is long-suffering, and God is gracious, and God is forgiving, and when we sin, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But when David sinned with Bathsheba in a very terrible, terrible matter, the Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 11, when kings go forth to war, uh, David didn't go. David stayed home, and then you know the story. 
In fact, <clears throat> oftentimes we think of negative things rather than positive things. If I say David's name, it'll come to your mind, David and Bathsheba. Or <clears throat> if we say the lady <clears throat> Hagar, we'll say Hagar, <clears throat> the, <clears throat> I guess we can call her Hagar, <clears throat> the prostitute. Hagar, the wicked woman, but Hagar got saved. Thank the Lord. God can change a life, and God does change a life. <clears throat> so David said when Nathan <clears throat> pointed an accusative finger in his face and said, Thou art the man, <clears throat> David was angry when he heard about that man that took one little ewe lamb when he had many lambs, and of course that was an illustration to David that David had taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite and had an affair with her, and in that affair they had a baby. And then David, you know, sin will take you farther than you want to go, <clears throat> keep you want longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you wanted to pay. That's the ravages of sin. <clears throat> so Nathan told the story to David, thou art the man, broke David's heart, and David said he will pay fourfold, and David paid fourfold. <clears throat> you look at the life of David after that sin with Bathsheba and lost the baby boy, lost his sons, uh, <clears throat> granddaughter raped, and then Absalom. Well, after the death of, of Amon, Absalom took off and fled and was gone for several years. Then Absalom came back. However, David, in his anger, chose not to have Absalom to come back into the palace. And Absalom became infuriated. You know the Bible says, and fathers provoke not your children to wrath, lest they be discouraged. There's a great responsibility for men as fathers to take the leadership in their homes and being the spiritual leader, the lover, <clears throat> the learner, and of course the listener, and the protector, the provider, uh, those things go without saying. However, uh, I find that many men are found wanting because they refuse to take the position of being the leaders they need to be. So there came a time then when um, Joab, David's cousin and general of David's army, sent to David to have him bring back Absalom. Did it with a woman and deception and Anyway, he had him come back, but he still didn't bring him back in his home. He let him go off to the side. Absalom, in his anger, chose to turn the heart of the people of God from his father to him. You know, there are people in the church that sometimes do that. Uh, they will try to get a little setting, or they'll get a little click, or they'll get a little remnant, and against the preacher, against the pastor, and they'll do those kinds of things. And over the years, and 43 years of preaching, we've had men come into our church and they've tried to turn the heart of the people away from the pastor, but God has been gracious and merciful and uh, in so many ways uh, to this preacher, and I thank him for that. So Absalom, when people would come to David for advice and for counseling, Absalom would then go up and kiss them and give them a, a hug and a kiss and say, if I was the king, things would be different. Well, after a fashion, Absalom finally decided to overthrow his father in such a way that David wanted to overthrow his father that he wanted to immediately have his father killed, and you know the story. But it broke the heart of David, and David now is leaving the palace. He's barefooted, going over the hill, and as he goes over the hill, he's weeping, they didn't have hoodies at those times, but he had a cloak over his head. And as he passed over Menaeus, um, he was weeping. And as he, Mahanaeus, sorry. And as he began to walk and the people walked with him, his heart was broken, he was weeping, and uh, he was leaving the palace. Not running for an enemy like Saul, but running from his own son, Absalom. David's heart is broken. And very possibly that's the setting behind Psalms 143. David with a broken heart. You know, it's a sad day when 
families fight, and they do. Uh, there's no such thing as the perfect home, the perfect family. There's no perfect dad, no perfect mom, no perfect children, no perfect preacher, no perfect church. You get the idea. But it's a sad day in the home when fathers choose not to take the position of being the leaders that they need to be. And that's the sad state of affairs. And in many homes, uh, there is division in the home because a husband is either lost or a wife is lost. Maybe you married when you were not a Christian and you then become a Christian and you're going to live for the Lord. And maybe your husband or maybe your wife uh, stops you or brings in all kind of difficulties. And so Psalms 143 is a psalm for you. <clears throat> maybe, and I had the song played for us this morning, uh, He Will Carry You. And I thought the girls did a really good job. That song was sung back in uh, 2013. So I don't know where they're at today. But uh, those three sisters really blessed my heart this morning as I looked them up and I was listening to others and I was listening to Ron Hamilton, where the leader of Patch the Pirate and began Patch the Pirate. And we, of course, had Patch the Pirate Club here in our church for years. Well, he now is suffering with dementia. So the family has a new song and he's not in it. And then his dear wife uh, wrote a book that would be good for you to read about mental illness. And uh, so that would be a good book. You can look her up. I think her name is Shelley uh, Hamilton. But maybe in your life, April the 3rd, you find yourself depressed. You find yourself in a blue day. You are discouraged. You're here this morning, but you're not really here. Uh, you're listening this morning, but you're not really listening in your pajamas. But I'm glad you're listening. And uh, so this psalm will be a great blessing to you and me when we allow it to be applied to our lives. Uh, they sung, there is no mountain too high that God cannot remove it. There is no storm so black that God cannot move it. Uh, there is no sorrow in your heart, no sadness. And so... Again, my text this morning is verse 4. And David says, Therefore is my spirit overwhelmed within me. Now, before I had a title for this message, I know of preachers who get a title then look for a message. Uh, that's the wrong way to do it. And uh, just to get a title and then find a message to go with their title, uh, that's, uh, that's wrong. And uh, so my topic, depression, my subject, the man after God's own heart. But I didn't have a title. But this morning, on my knees before the Lord, he gave me my title. Overwhelmed or overcome. We are overcomers. God doesn't save you from the storm. He saves you in the storm. Uh, God doesn't say, I will never leave you nor forsake you and then leave you. Look at Psalms 127 for a moment. Psalms 127. Well, when you got to Psalms 127, go back to Psalms 121. Psalms 121, notice what it says. I'll lift up my eyes under the hills from which cometh my help. For 40 years the Israelites traveled in the wilderness. They did not have to travel in the wilderness. There was an 11 day journey from Egypt to Kadesh Barnea, 11 days. And yet they chose to rebel against God. Now watch it. I usually preach at least once a year from Numbers chapter 13. And when the 12 spies went in to the promised land and uh, 10 came out with the evil report the Bible says to uh, Caleb and Joshua Joshua became the greatest general on the pages of history ever 
31 kings and kingdoms he defeated. 10 of the 12 spies said, we saw ourselves as grasshoppers. I've been preaching for a few Sunday evenings, with the exception of last Sunday, when I began a little series on the blood, on depression. And I said in that series on depression, do not listen to yourself. Talk to yourself. Talk to yourself about the word of God and let the Bible speak to your help, to your heart. So remember, they said, we are like grasshoppers. We saw the sons of Anak. We saw the giants. We saw the wall. Now the problem is they didn't look high enough to see the Lord. When you look to the Lord, the psalmist said, I lift up my eyes in the hill from which cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord. But now watch it what it says. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. So that's pretty good. We have a wonderful God, a creator, a savior who loves us and cares for us. And notice back to Psalms 143. When we begin to look at circumstances and people and things, uh, we get ourselves depressed. Why? Because circumstances come whatever they change, they alter as God sees fit. We look at people, they will always disappoint, but God never disappoints. We look at things, they break down. But when we look to the Lord, he said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. And yet it seems like we feel like Spurgeon's, who said to his, his wife said to him, as she came down one morning for breakfast, wearing black, he said, who died? And she said, God must have died because you're going around moping and uh, to be moping and to murmur. Uh, to murmur is to complain against God. When we murmur or complain against God, we certainly lose our joy in the Lord. And when we lose our joy in the Lord, uh, we're in trouble. Paul said, I cannot do anything in Christ Jesus. No, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ Jesus. And uh, all things, that is, that God wants us to do. So let's notice David's plea. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Isn't it wonderful to know that God hears our prayers? Jesus said, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask that you shall receive that your joy might be full. David's talking about the names of God. On Wednesday evenings for the last couple of months, I've been preaching on the names of God. Jehovah Jireh. Jehovah, when you see the word Lord all in caps in the Old Testament, that's the name Jehovah. Jehovah is the self-existing one that reveals himself, himself. So one of the names is Jehovah Jireh. That is the Lord sees and he will provide. Jehovah Rapha, he is the healer. Now, I often say that God doesn't necessarily choose to heal, but if he doesn't heal, he'll give grace. I have been living, not looking for any <clears throat> sympathy, but for going on 17 years now from some issues that I had with prostate cancer. And then some of you, dear ones, are waiting on the Lord for heart issues, high blood pressure, precious dear sister waiting for a kidney, uh, another sister of a sister having blood issues. We all have issues. These bodies humble us. Someone said if you have your health, you have everything, and I disagree with that. If you have Jesus, you have everything. And how sad it is that some of us listen to the slithering snake when we should be trusting our Savior. Not listening to the doubt from hell, but listening from the truth from heaven. So David's calling out to God. He's looking to the right source. Uh, his 
greatest Ahithophel, counselor has left him and gone with Absalom. Others have left David and gone with Absalom. And so there David is on his way, uh, walking over the hill, barefooted, weeping that his son would turn on him. You know, I was thinking this morning, praying this morning and thinking, and by the way, if God doesn't speak to my heart, I can't speak to your heart. If God doesn't give me the message, I can't give you the message. And so I finished up on hell, preached on hell last Sunday morning. I was going to preach on it again this morning, but I uh, chose to go another way. And so when I was filling out verses for you for tomorrow or yesterday, uh, I'm just reading through my Bible. I don't look for sermons. I just look from my heart to be right with the Lord. And Psalms 43 came upon my heart. And uh, so I saw it and uh, looked at it and sent out the beginning uh, on, on Friday the, uh, or Saturday the uh, end verses of this chapter. And then this morning, of course, with the beginning verses. So first of all, uh, David is crying out to God, hear my prayer, O Lord. Do you see that? That's Jehovah. Uh, Jehovah Shammah. Jehovah Nisan. The Lord, our banner, our warring Lord. Uh, Exodus 15, 3 says, God is a God of war. Uh, Jehovah Shalom, uh, another name for God. He is our peace. Jehovah Siskinu, that is the Lord, is our righteousness. And so as we begin to look at some of the names of the Lord, uh, I believe they will bless your heart if you'll take the time to look at them and to listen. If you can't make it on Wednesday night, I hope you'll listen Wednesday night. If you can't make it to Sunday night, I hope that you'll listen to Sunday night. And uh, hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my supplications. Supplications are your request. Uh, some people just pray and they pray all over the place. But to be specific is to ask God what we want. In thy faithfulness, did you see that? God is faithful. Thank the Lord, he's faithful. And he's the faithful one. We're not faithful, but he's always faithful. And not only that, but notice, uh, he's righteous. He's the righteous God. Just and right is he, Deuteronomy says. So he is faithful. The Lord answers in verse 1. Uh, the Lord's answer is in verse 1. And then look at verses 2 through 4. David says, the Lord aided me. Will he aid you? Will he help you? Will he strengthen you? Will he watch over you? Will he comfort you? Will he be your shepherd? We learned last uh, Wednesday night, uh, Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. And of course, he is the great shepherd. But is he your shepherd? Do you know him as your shepherd? If he's the shepherd, he'll provide for us. Notice verse 2. And enter not into judgment with thy servant. Over and over in the book of 1 Samuel, David is talking to the Lord about being his servant. So whose servant are you? Whose servant are we? Who do we serve? So I was thinking then again about the time when Jesus looked at Peter. Going to the cross, kicked from pillar to post, going from Caiaphas to Herod to Pilate and back and forth, tired, exhausted, a sham, it was all a sham, this mock, wicked trial. And yet Peter, I don't know him. I don't know what you're talking about. Peter warming his hands at the fire of the enemy. Warming his hands. Beloved, when you start fellowshipping with the world, you're in trouble. 
John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that's in the world, here it is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is the world. And the world passes away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. We're not to love the world, but we're to love the sinners that are in the world. Because I'm a sinner, and if you would be honest, we're all sinners. And God says about that in Isaiah 53 and verse 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way, and the Lord, and the Lord laid on him the inequity of us all. And so I thought, as I thought about Peter, you know, oftentimes we are critics, we're critical, we're judgmental, we're gossips, and we need to do as my wife has wisely said, put a circle in the sand and get on our knees before the Lord and say, Lord, how about me? And I can imagine how Peter must have felt when the Lord looked at Peter. Peter had denied him. Jesus had warned him. I preached the word of God. I've been preaching for going on 43 years. And people don't listen. They don't listen. Goes in one ear, not the other ear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I was obedient to my Lord? Wouldn't it be wonderful if each of us obeyed the Lord, walked with the Lord, listened to the Lord, obeyed that which he said? And remember, remember King Saul when he turned away from God. And Samuel said, to obey is better than the sacrifice than the fat of lambs. For rebellion is the sin of witchcraft. God hates it. We're rebels by choice. We're rebels by birth. And if we're going to live in depression, and so many of God's people are living in depression, we don't have to be in depression. We don't have to live in depression because our God is able. Our God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that work in us. So where's your faith, Jesus had to say, when he was in the ship asleep, and they woke him up and said, Lord, careth not that we perish? How can you perish when Jesus is on the boat? So Peter is warming himself with the world, warming his hands. Beloved, when you fellowship with the world, the world will take you away from Jesus. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. My heart is broken as I daily send out verses to people who no longer come to church. They quit God. They quit the church. And that makes me think, now who are they fellowshipping with? Who, who are they spending time with if they're not spending time with God's people? So remember, Satan's a liar, beloved, and is a deceiver, and he's a slithering snake, and his desire is to break up your home, your family, your marriage, to rob your children of a godly home, a godly family. And so thank the Lord for those of you who are being faithful. And those who may be listening who are not faithful, don't listen to the lie of Satan. Satan will say, well, you've fallen, you're not going to get back up. David says that. And David talks about his falling and uh, pleading to the Lord when he talks about his falling and how he fell. And because he fell, David begins to ask the Lord, don't judge me. Please don't judge me. Have mercy on me. Notice, and enter not into judgment with thy servant. For in thy sight shall no man living be justified. For the enemy hath persecuted my soul. And it doesn't do despite to the verse to say he persecutes, pursues me. Absalom pursuing his father. Think about that. A son wanting to kill a father. What would happen 
Again, as you look back at David, you see fathers, preachers. I said once tonight, I am responsible before God to give an account of what I preach, how I preach, why I preach, the attitude in which I preach. And you're responsible for what you listen to. We're all going to give an account of ourselves to the Lord. So David has to look inside and look at his own situation. And finally, Peter, the Bible says he went out and he wept bitterly. Now, don't lose this. So when you fall, my beloved, and we fall, but we don't fail. We do fall. A just man falls seven times, but he gets back up. So when you fall, get back up. <sighs> Unto him that's able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us. If you're not reading your Bible, you have no faith. If you're not walking with God, you have no faith. If you're not fellowshipping with God's people, you have no faith. If you're fellowshipping with the world, the world will suck you in, beloved. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of unrighteousness. Have no fellowship. What fellowship hath light with darkness? None. I'm concerned about our young girls. I'm concerned about our young men. Jobs come on the scene. And now you have a job. And just like going off to school, and I kind of been hammering this for years about school. School is a necessary evil. You need reading, writing, you need that. But when you get too involved in the school, becomes the tail wagging the dog, and you forget about the church, you're in trouble. When you go off to work, yes, you need to make money. I think a lot of folks make money just so they can have more things. And because of that, you miss your family. You miss time in the house of the Lord. Overtime, 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 no time with the family. Too busy, too busy, too busy, too busy. When Jesus rose from the dead and Peter was so discouraged, Jesus said these words to Mary. Go tell the disciples I've risen and Peter. And Peter. Put your name there. That's you too. You fall and then Satan tempts us to sin. To have no temptation is to be contemptible. We are tempted daily. Every day we're tempted to do wrong or to do right. We're tempted. Paul said, know you not that to whom you yield your members' servants to obey, his servants you are, sin unto death, or obedience unto righteous. So this is righteous, and this is unrighteous. So who shall we serve? We have a choice. God doesn't put a key in our back and make us robots. God says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. His commandments are to protect us. A mother says to a child, don't run across the street, darling. Or look both ways. Don't touch that plug. Don't put a fork in that plug. Don't put your hand on a hot stove. And people like it or they lump it. So when it comes to the life of Peter, who had fallen prey to the wrong crowd. But when Jesus said the encouraging words to Mary, go tell my disciples and Peter, I'm going to Galilee. Man, that did something to Peter's heart. And Peter was faithful. Twelve spies went into Kadesh Barnea. They saw the fruit. They saw the land that God said, it's wonderful. It's wonderful. I already know about it. But just to be sure, maybe go walk through it. Taste the fruit. See the people. See the land. See what's going on. And the Bible says they brought back fruit that was so large, it took two men to, on a pole to carry the great cluster. It was so big. And yet the Bible says 10 of them had an evil report. The same way we have evil reports towards God. Why? We look the wrong way. 
You look horizontal at circumstances, people, and they, there are a lot of quitting places. A lot of places to quit. Well, the people discouraged me. Well, the people didn't care about me. Well, the people didn't look after me. Well, the people, the people, the people. Who does the preacher serve? We serve the Lord. And he's the shepherd, the great shepherd. He's the chief shepherd. And the pastor is the under shepherd. So when you get your eyes on the people and expect the people to do what they cannot do, and that's why John chapter 2, Jesus is not kidding himself to man because he knew it was in man. What's in man? My flesh. Don't look to me. Look to Jesus. Yes, the Bible says follow the preacher that follows the Lord, but I will fail you. If you look to me and, and get all wrapped up in me and I croak, die, what happens? Oh, our pastor is gone. I'm just flesh and blood. All my enemies just said, yes, you are. Yes, you are, buddy. But think about it, beloved. Overcomers or overwhelmed? Overcomers or overwhelmed? So here's the sign. I'm overwhelmed. Okay. Okay. You can be overwhelmed. Don't listen to all the propaganda on the news stations. Don't listen to all, don't listen to false preachers. People call me and they say, I'm listening to this guy. Don't listen to that guy. But there's no sense saying that. Because the moment I say don't listen to that guy, guess what's happened? Or I can see people in the church that are going through struggles and difficulties and I know that that uh, I know what's going on in their, in their lives, and I can go to people and say, you should fellowship with that family. You know what they'll do? They'll fellowship with that family. Because preacher, you know, he's cracked up anyway. So beloved, I'm simply saying, come on in, the water's fine. Living for Jesus satisfies. Living for Satan is a great disappointment. And Joshua defeated all the enemies. All the enemies. And Joshua chapter 1, over and over, God is saying, encourage Joshua. Now, I'm not looking for somebody to say that was a good sermon. Because if, if there's any praise, it all goes to him. But sometimes you need to be encouraged. Sometimes you need to say to your church, by the way, by the way, You ever go to Starbucks and have, I'm going to get in trouble now, but I can handle it. You ever have egg bites? Egg bites? There's pepper egg bites. There's bacon egg bites. Well, my dear wife, ooh, ooh, <laughs> she made me some egg bites yesterday. Uh-huh. Thought I died and went to heaven. So I said to my dear wife, When was the last time you said to your wife, wow? When was the last time you said to your husband, hey, big boy? <laughs> when was the last time you said to your kids, I'm so happy that you're my son? Don't compare your children with other children. I wish you were like, no, you don't know what goes on behind that fence. Be like the preacher. No, be like Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, discouraged, dismayed, Revelation 12. Revelation 12. Now, there comes a time in my home, my home, when I walk from room to room and I plead the blood. Huh? I plead the blood. Yeah, our preacher has gone crazy. No, no, I plead the blood. Why? Because there are demons. How many of you believe there's demons? There's my wife and I, two of us. <laughs> How many of you believe in angels? There's a few more. How many of you know you have an angel that watches over you? How many of you know that? How many of you know that the devil has a bunch of bad angels following his crowd? And they can get in through your music, through your movies, to the internet, 
I would like to make a challenge. In just a few moments, maybe, oh, 45 minutes, I'm going to stop. And I'd like to make a challenge to see how many will leave without turning on your phone. Anybody want to? Huh? How many will leave this morning without? I can't do that. See my thumbs? So I have to go. So I go through my house from pillar to post, from the attic to the basement, and I plead the blood. And here's how I do it, okay? Here's why I do it. So, overwhelmed or overcomer? Revelation 12, verse 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. Who's the dragon? Devil. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither was there place found any more in heaven. That hasn't happened yet, but it's going to happen. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, the accuser of the brethren, which deceived the whole world, was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, the power of his Christ. For the accuser, when we sin, beloved, Satan goes in the presence of God. He has access to God. We know that from Job 1 and 2. And he talks to God about you. So get the picture. Here is me doing something bad. And I grieve the Holy Spirit that lives in me. But because the Holy Spirit lives in me, he's my fail safe and he tells me when I've done wrong. If I'm in tune with him, if I'm walking in the Spirit... I'm in tune with him. I'm sensitive to his leadership, his guidance, his direction. I don't want to grieve him by sinning. I don't want to quench him by trying to do the work of God in my flesh. I don't want to vax him by continuing to live wrong. So the moment I sin, Satan goes in the presence of God the Father who's on his throne. Jesus, who died for our sins, sitting at his right hand. And Satan stands up before the Lord and he accuses me and says, you call that guy a preacher? He's a preacher? Let's look, finish the verse. Verse 10 says, he is the accuser of our brethren. And for the accuser of brothers cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. But now wait a minute. The moment I sin, do you sin? I sin. Do you sin? You probably don't sin. I sin. 1 John 1, 8 says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and his word is not in us. But verse 9 says, if we confess our sin, that is, I say to God, God, I did that, I don't want to do that, but I did it, I'm weak, I did it, I did it in a moment of anger. You see, some Christian sins, and I watch this, they sin because they're angry at God. It's called paybacks. To be bitter against God is a terrible thing. That's why the fruit of the Spirit says faithfulness, meekness, and temperance. That is, I'm faithful to him. I'm not going to accuse him. I'm not going to be critical of him, angry at him, and temperance. Lord, this is in your hands. My depression has been brought about because I'm not obeying your word. My cloudy day my doubt and my discouragement is because I've taken my eyes off of you. And I've listened to the snake, the dragon, the devil, Satan. And because of that, look at verse 11, beloved. And they, see it? Overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they love not the life, their lives, unto the death. That's dead to sin, beloved. Dead to sin, dead to self. Are you dead to yourself? Have you come to the place in your life where when you wake up in the morning, you submit to the Holy Spirit, you put on the armor of God, and you die to self? 
You know how to keep your home from being a mess or the church house a mess? You're dead. I die daily. But we have aspirations, things we want to do. I want it my way. I want this. Do you have any goals in your life? Do you have short-term, mid-term, long-range goals in your life to be more like Christ? To be for Him? Turn back to our text. Psalms 143. Psalms 143. Oh, my soul. Beloved. My beloved. You know what beloved means? It means loved of God. <coughs> I just look at this with me. <coughs> the Lord aid me. My soul is doomed, verse 2. My safety is destroyed, verse 3. My spirit is desolate, verse 4. David's attitude, verse 5. I remember the days of old. I remember when I took care of that lion. I remember when I took care of that bear. I remember when I killed that giant. I remember that. Have you ever gone back to the old days? That when you walked with the Lord? Have you ever gone back to the blessings of the Lord days gone by? Well, how about today? If he blessed you back then, cannot he bless us now? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that's within me. Bless his holy name. Verse number six, God's presence. I search, stretch forth my hand unto thee. My soul thirsteth for thee as a thirsty land. Now go, if you will. Chapter 46, 146. Just reading the Bible. Now, here's my sermon. That's it. And at the end of my sermon, I'm going to jump there. <coughs> Psalms 146, verse 5. What's the first word? Huh? Happy, blessed is he that hath the God of Jacob, not the God of Israel, not the God of Abraham, not the God of Moses, but Jacob. Jacob was a simple, plain man, a usurper. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his, for his help, whose hope is in Jehovah, his God. What did he do? He made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that therein is, which keepeth truth forever, which executed judgment for the oppressed, which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord opened the eyes of the blind. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth, who? The righteous. The Lord preserveth the stranger. He, he, notice, he relieveth the fatherless and widow. But the way of the wicked, he turneth upside down. Two groups of people that God is particularly close to, and that is widows and orphans. The Lord shall reign forever. Even thy God, O Zion, Unto all generations, and notice what it says, praise the Lord. Look at chapter 147, verse 3. He healeth the broken in heart and bind up their wounds. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Billions of stars. Does he not know where you're at? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. Knows all about it. He knows. Job said, he knoweth the way that I take. When he's tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He knows where you're at this morning. He's the God that created all of this. Cannot we trust him? Cannot we depend on him? Cannot we look to him, believe on him, walk with him, be faithful to him as he's faithful to us, looking for him to meet our needs daily? 
to look after us, to allow his will to be done in our lives, saying as Jesus in the garden, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, not my will, but thine be done. Again this morning, I saw a young lady that used to ride our bus, well, our Jeep. We brought little kids to Sunday school when we first came to town. Brought them to Sunday school. I saw her dad about four months ago. Her dad has never come to church. He's promised, but he's never come to church. And after a fashion, they quit coming to church, the girls. When I saw their dad four or five months ago, Said my wife passed. I said, sorry to hear that. So this morning, I decided this morning to go get me a decaf, oat milk, extra hot, one pump, caramel macchiato. So I'm ready to preach for another at least 35 minutes. But the girl was there. She said, you still here? One guy said to me one day, J-Bass, he said, you're still here? I thought you were dead. What a lovely man he was. His wife came to church for a couple weeks. He came to our first anniversary service. Very wealthy man, but lost. And when I got through preaching, he said, this is not a church. We were at that time in the Peter Pond um, School, downtown, no longer there. But he came to our first anniversary service. I think we had 50 people there. 10 people got saved that morning. And when he left, he said, this is not a church. Hmm. Years later, I saw him again. And the first thing came out of his mouth is, I thought you were dead. I said, no, not yet. So then today, seeing that young girl that used to ride our Sunday school, said, you're still here. Aren't you going to retire? And I said this. I said, I'm going to heaven from Port McMurray. And I gave her a devotional. Beloved, I'm not looking for the undertaker. I'm looking for the upper taker. But if I have to go the way of the, the grave, I know. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is that victory? So the worst thing can happen to me is I die. I die. And I'm not going to a bad place. Now let's finish and we'll be done. He telleth the number of the stars. He calleth them all by their names. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. He knows all about it, beloved. The Lord lifted up the meek. He casteth the wicked down to the ground. Verse 10 and 11. He delighteth not in the strength of the horse. He taketh no pleasure in the legs of a man. The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him and those that hope in his mercy. Shall we stand together? When my spirit is overwhelmed, The Bible says, when the enemy comes in like a flood, lift up a standard. Here's the standard. This old-fashioned King James Bible. Preacher, why do you use that King James? There's so many versions, because this makes Jesus look better. Because mm -hmm. it's got the blood all over it. In fact, that's why I preach from a red Bible. Blood. You get under the blood of Jesus Christ, and you're burning hell. God commended his love towards us and that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more now being justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. Jesus died, shed his blood, and those wounds, wounds. Someone says scars. They write a song, the scar. No, they're wounds. Scars means they've been healed. The wound, he was wounded for our transgressions. Bruised for our inequities. 
The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes were he healed. He's coming again, beloved. He died for my sin, our sins, paid our sin debt, went to the grave, rose victoriously, ascended to heaven. He's at God's right hand on my behalf. That's why I end my prayer in Jesus' name. That's the authority and the power. And he's coming again. And I'm going to go see him. And it could be very soon. Very soon. You know when he's coming? When the last Gentile bows their head and says yes to Jesus, he's coming. Could be this morning. You're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Savior? The 3rd of April would be a great day for you to get saved. And be sure that when you die, heaven will be your home. Because, beloved, if you die without Jesus, after hearing this message, if you die without Jesus, or if Jesus comes tomorrow morning, and you've heard the, the gospel that he died for our sins, shed his blood in payment, went to the grave, rose again, descended to heaven, is coming again, and you reject Jesus, and you put it off, there'll be no second chance for you, beloved. The Bible says God will give you strong delusion that you should believe alive, that you may be damned, who believe not the love of God, that they might be saved. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And Father, we thank you for this day. This morning I wrestled just for a couple moments with preaching once again on hell. But you gave me no liberty. And so the morning's message is the morning message that you gave me to preach. My spirit is overwhelmed. My heart within me is desolate, abandoned, no help, no hope. Paul said, if we have hope only in this life, we're all men most miserable. Thank you that there's hope beyond the grave. Thank you we have a home in heaven waiting for us because of what you did on the cross and the empty tomb and the ascension after the resurrection and coming again. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Do you know if you were to die the 3rd of April, would you go to heaven? Do you know that? If you know that, would you be a testimony for the Lord and just raise your hand? I know I'm going to heaven. My sins are forgiven. I know my sins are forgiven. Here's my hand. Amen. God bless you. You can do that. God bless you. You can do that. You may take them down. Thank you for that. Now, some of you couldn't raise your hand. If heaven is real, hell is real. And if you die without Jesus, if your name is not recorded by the recording angel that God has given to you, that angel records everything we say, everything we do, and one day books will be opened. Everything you've done in your life is going to be shouted from the rooftops. That's why we confess our sins and get it right. But beloved, it'll be a wonderful day. April the 3rd, 2022, you got saved. Preacher, you pray for me. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm concerned. Would you pray for me? Here's my hand. Here's my hand. Pray for me. Pray for me. Yes, I see those hands. I'm not sure if I died, I'd go to heaven. I'm concerned. Would you pray for me? I see that hand. Yes. Thank you. You may take it down. Preacher, I'm saved, but you know what? I've been living in a cloud of depression. Discouraged dismayed, feeling abandoned and desolate. I need Jesus to be Lord of my life. Would you pray for me this morning? That's my need. Jesus to be the Lord of my life, to master my life, to believe and trust and wait on him. Would you pray for me? God bless you. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you for honesty. And then finally, unspoken, unspoken in my soul, unspoken request. Would you remember me, preacher? I have an unspoken request. Pray for me. Pray for me. All over the place. All over the place. And Father, 
David cried and said, Oh God, oh Lord God. We're praying this morning. Oh Lord God. We're needy people. We need you. And Lord, as the song we had played this morning, if you carried the world on your shoulders when you went to the cross, certainly you can carry our burdens. Cast thy burden upon the Lord. He shall sustain thee. He should never suffer the righteous to be moved. Lord, bless this invitation. Have your way. Save that soul that's near as hell. Reclaim that Christian who has slidden back into the world, the flesh, and the devil. Strengthen the resolve of thy children is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We're singing number? 271. 271. 271. You need to come this morning at this old-fashioned altar and talk to the Lord. Would you just come now? Just come now. Come for salvation, surrender, service. Come and bring your burden to Jesus. I've wandered far away from God. Now I'm coming home. The paths of sin too long I've tried. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam, open wide, Lord, I'm coming home, I wasted many prayers. Now I'm coming home, I now repent with bitter tears, Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home, never more to roam, open wide. Lord, I'm coming home. I've tired of sin and strain. Now I'm coming home. I'll trust thy love, believe thy word. Lord, I'm coming, singing, praying. Coming, coming. Never more to roam, open wide thy arms of love, Lord, I'm coming home. My soul is sick, my heart is sore, now I'm coming home, my strength renewed, my hope restored. Lord, I'm coming home, coming home, coming home.